In this video, we're going to talk about the idea of bias. And that general idea means you took your sample, you got data, but that data is not good in some way. It doesn't really represent the population in some fashion. And we're going to break it down into a, a few different types of bias that you might have, you might see in a given sample. Uh, so the first one is called sampling bias. And this is when the sample that you took does not represent the population as a whole. So this is when the sample you chose is not representative of the population as a whole. And specifically, the idea of undercoverage, undercoverage is uh, when part of the population um, does not have enough representation in the sample. So it's a type of sampling bias here. So for example, let's say we are interested in movie uh, interests for everyone in the US and we take a sample and we end up asking 100 men what their movie preferences are. If our population is everyone in the US, well, obviously we have under coverage for women in our sample since everyone is a man. And that is definitely not the true case for the whole population. Now, most samples are not going to be quite that extreme for being under coverage in a given uh, scenario, but quite often, even when you try your best, some uh, aspects of your population will not be, uh, will experience under coverage. So we very often will look at data and we will break it down by different groups, maybe racial, ethnic, gender, whatever other uh, ways we want to break down our group. We want to look to see whether the percentage of our sample you know, closely matches the percentage of the population. And again, even when you have a good sample, it's not necessarily going to be the case. So this is something that you pretty often are going to have to deal with. Sometimes it's not going to be very much, in which case you can kind of ignore it or work around it. Other times your, your data may be completely useless and you might want to just throw away the whole thing and start from scratch. Now, let's suppose you are taking a survey and you take a lot of time and effort to design your sample, a group of individuals that does accurately represent the population as a whole. You have all the percentages of each different group and category locked in so it works out perfectly you mail out or email those surveys to all those individuals and you're like, sweet, I'm going to have like the best data. It's going to be so perfectly representative. Everything's wonderful. And only a handful of people actually respond to your survey. I don't know about you, but I've quite often been asked to do surveys over and over and over again in my life. And I pretty much routinely ignore them. I have no interest in doing surveys unless someone's going to pay me for that. And so I skip it. And I'm not alone. Lots of people skip these surveys. And so as a result, there are going to be people that we select for our sample, but don't respond. And as a result, that is going to create what we call non-response bias. So this is when the individuals who do respond to the survey or other way of gathering information uh, do not accurately represent the population. So getting back to that earlier one where I asked people what their movie habits were and I happened to have a sample of 100 men, maybe I sent out 200 surveys, 100 men and 100 women, but only the men responded. So, you know, it really wouldn't have been sampling bias there because my sample that I chose was representing the population, about half and half, but it was due to the non-response bias because only certain people chose to respond, and that's what we have. And in fact, 
there's been a lot of studies about non-response bias and, and things that might happen. For example, uh, people that respond to surveys, maybe people that have more free time on their hands to do that and might be you know, in a better uh, income class than others. You know, if, if people are working you know, three or four jobs and trying to just get by, you know, pay their rent and so on, they might not have as much time in order to respond to these random surveys. And as a result, the data they collected is gonna be skewed toward people with these higher incomes. Or um, it could be people that have access to, you know, say a computer to respond to the survey, whereas other people may not have daily access to the computer. Or there are lots of things that can go wrong on these. And, you know, that's why non-response bias is something that anyone that's ever going to design a survey has to take into account. And in fact, I believe the numbers I've heard is that most surveys have less than a 10% response rate. And so that's, again, something you have to take into account whenever you're going to go out and gather data. Now, if you are reading in your textbook, there is an example they gave where uh, people took a survey using these voluntary response results, and they were predicting who was going to win the next election. And as a result, they got it completely and totally wrong. Because again, the people that had the time and were part of the sample that actually responded to it were from one group of people and that group of people was actually relatively small compared to the population as a whole and the people that were not ones that would be responding to that survey they you know as a whole pretty much voted for the other candidate and it completely skewed the results so you understand that these biased things that can come into play they can make your data completely and totally useless and this is why we have to think about as we have to consider these whenever we are doing some sort of data collection method. Now you might say, okay, so non-response bias makes sense. People that aren't responding are causing the data to be skewed. So how is there also something response bias? Like whether they don't respond or they do respond, it's, it's both wrong. Well, it's not quite the same thing. So response bias, this is when the response you receive is not the correct data. And you might say, well, why in the world would that happen? Well, there are many reasons why you might have response bias in a given survey. Let's say, for example, someone comes up to you in the mall and starts asking you detailed questions about your sex life. Are you really going to be completely open and honest with this random person that just walked up to you? I mean, I certainly would not, and I would imagine a lot of you would not do that. You might ignore them, you might walk away, or you might just give them whatever answers you feel like just to get them to, to leave you alone, in which case the answers you're giving are not necessarily the correct answers. Uh, you could also have situations where the person asking the question might phrase it such a way that it's confusing and cause the other person to give the wrong answer. Uh, you may have seen trick questions at other times in your life where it was asked in a weird way that made you give the wrong answer because you, you misunderstood what was going on. Sometimes uh, people doing interviews will ask questions in a certain order to elicit a different response than what might be in, in order. Like, say watch a movie where there's a trial and someone's on trial being questioned on the stand. If the lawyer goes right up and says, did you kill this person? Or, oh, I'm ready for that question. I'm going to say no. But when they start asking you these leading questions in order, the person might get flustered and then say something they didn't mean to. And, you know, it's a big th scene in the show and suddenly you now know that they were the killer. Um, but I'm not saying that in this class we're interviewing murderers, but instead, just think about how if you ask questions in a certain order, in a certain pace, you can sometimes elicit responses from individuals that otherwise you would not have been able to do. Uh, here's another really simple way you can get a response bias. Someone could write down the answer wrong. Again, if you've ever done any type of data collection or data input on a computer before, I guarantee you, you've messed up something at some point. Typo here, 
clicking the wrong box there. It's going to happen to every single one of these. And every time that happens, that's an example of a response bias. So response bias, again, is something that you're going to have to deal with, but it's also something that you can generally try to manage. On the other hand, if you're looking at someone else's data and their conclusion, you might want to look into exactly how they asked the questions to try to see if they were you know, doing some sort of funny business to get answers that would not have been there. So keep in mind that you know, when you see these like news headlines saying, oh, a new study claims this, that, and the other thing, and it's some sort of extravagant result, Sometimes there are these types of biases, these types of you know, manipulation going on that you wanna to try to see through and see beyond that. Okay, so the last part here is the difference between sampling versus non-sampling errors. So what can we have here? Non-sampling errors, if you want to break them up, so non-sampling errors can happen even in a census. So these are things that like, even if you're taking, trying to take data from every single person in the population, some of them might not respond. Uh, even if you get the data, maybe someone will enter it wrong. These are all things that will be non-sampling errors. These are things that happen even if you try to question everyone in the population. The other hand, sampling errors, these are errors that happen as a result of using a sample to estimate a population. So if you happen to take a, a sample that was bad randomly, that the reason why you got bad data there, that would be a sampling error because it's based on the sample you took and how that sample wasn't actually matching up with the population. So when you look at different errors, try to if you want to try to decide whether it's a sampling error or non-sampling error, try to see is it based on the fact that we have a sample that's not a perfect representation of the population? Or is it something that could have happened even if we were trying to ask everyone in the population? That's kind of a good way to, to break it.